But I think um, we're perhaps in a good position because um, there's time to kind of reflect. Um, and in the beginning, obviously, things are a bit kind of mad. So that's going to happen. Um, in the next few days, um, along with support from Annette there. Hi, Annette. Um, uh, I think um, the main sort of theme, fielding, like you said, is a really important theme for women. Um, sort of juggling childcare, um, taking lots of the responsibility for that, um, looking after their own situation if they're shielding but also if they're sh looking after children who are shielding or caring for others also who are shielding so there's um, lots of issues around the practicalities of dealing um, with looking after pe many people who are different situations some going back to school some not going back to school some who are shielding some who are not um, so that's the theme so yeah I'm here um, from uh, Leeds Women's Aid and Leeds Domestic Violence Service. Um, our services have seen an, a gradual increase. It, it dropped off when the restrictions were first imposed, but now it's been gradually increasing and we anticipate that that will get worse or get increased more once the restrictions are lifted more. Um, because people are trapped in their homes with perpetrators, so it's quite difficult to make a phone call. So we, we offer now an online chat as well which, to make it a bit easier. Um, it's also taking longer to deal with clients to get help of professionals. And um, so, yeah, it's taking longer and we're dealing with more. Um, but we're, I think we're doing well. Um, and we're being very flexible. So, yeah, that's it, I think. Brilliant, yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Karis, would you like to go next? Hi, hi everyone. Um, I'm Karis Green. I work for the Leeds Society for Deaf and Blind People. So, um, for us initially, um, we were mobilising our services, so predominantly BSL services, um, and delivering those virtually. Over the last sort of couple of weeks, we're now seeing a really big increase in the face-to-face -face requests coming through for us and starting to um, look at how we can start delivering our services again on a face-to-face -face basis, so going into the hospitals and providing those services. Um, so I think for us, that's been a key focus of the last couple of weeks, really, is preparing staff, making sure we've got adequate PPE, um, looking at the different environments and things like that. And alongside that, where we're not required to deliver the face-to-face, -face, we've been doing some work to look at how we can best provide virtual services um, across the board. So one of the things we've been looking at recently, which is um, just started for us this week, is providing some BSL befriending services for the hospital tools um, which is really exciting because it's come on the back of some feedback that we've had but it's an opportunity for anyone staying in hospital who is a BSL user to actually contact and have some communication um, through a befriending service which we're now delivering so that's a couple of things we've been focusing on over the last couple of weeks. Excellent that's really good. Jen from Turning Lives Around. Hi, um, my name is Jen Bravo. I'm Services Coordinator for Turning Lives Around, which is a spotted housing provision in Leeds. Um, I think you might be familiar with James, who manages Beacon, so Beacon is part of Turning Lives Around as well. So we've just pretty much got all our services um, geared up to deal with this. Huge issues with PPE, but it's pretty much sorted now. Um, We've got some staff that are shielding, some staff that are um, extremely anxious, um, but things seem to be calming down a little bit because a lot of the anxiety was around um, the clients that we were working with who really weren't social distancing. Some of the young people, very bored now, um, so that creates additional anxiety for staff. Most staff are delivering some sort of face-to-face -face, um, support, again, um, again with adherence to um, social distancing. That will probably increase, but again, we just need to be mindful of the changes in, in guidance in respect to that and managing staff expectation. So far, I think we've responded pretty well, um, but obviously 
it's still continuing, so there is still potential for impact. We need to see what's happening with the testing tracing, because obviously if somebody tests positive in our settings, that has implications for the whole service and implications for the whole staffing. So um, work in progress, I'd say. Yeah, thank you. And it'd be good to come back to thinking what we can do to help and support that. Thank you. Thank you. Owen from... It's yeah. awesome, man. Yeah. <laughs> Hiya. Um, so um, I guess kind of echoing probably what most services are seeing is that uh, um, the engagement is fairly low, but when we are engaging with people, it's uncovering uh, mental health difficulties and that kind of thing. I guess we always have a problem in that um, a lot of the services aren't uh, kind of autism specific. So finding the right therapies and the right kind of things for people it, it is always difficult and there's work we're doing with that, but it's not come to fruition yet and, and, and kind of been put slightly on hold by all of this, but hopefully we'll be looking to pick that up um, through different projects. Um, one area that's causing people slightly less anxiety since a really unclear guidance was issued um, is going outside and being stopped by the police and that kind of thing. Um, we're doing we're doing some work with uh, social police around um, doing site engagement um, yeah, consultation with people. I got quite a bit of feedback from that, and as a result of that, we're looking at getting statements from the police that are kind of uh, black and white. So as black and white as they can be, so clarifying what they can clarify um, and trying to give guidance on what they, they can't, <laughs> um, which is obviously a difficult thing for them. Here, yeah, I'm talking about Leeds Faith Forum, but I do faith engagement generally at West Yorkshire Police, amongst many other things. So j just to echo what Owen has said, um, although, we, although there's work going on in relation to supporting people with autism, would welcome any 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 comments on how people with other uh, disabilities, with other impairments, can be supported by us. Um, Owen has been fantastic in creating this particular survey, um, which which we've chatted through. It's been really really good. Lots of lots of fantastic feedback. Um, from the perspective of the faith sector sector and Leeds Faith Forum we've actually just had a call uh, one of the big things that we actually spoke about was about places of worship opening up again mm. and some of the safeguards that might need to be put in place um, because obviously you've got national organizations who are giving guidance local organizations You've got small places of worship, large places of worship, and that will have implications for what is possible and isn't possible. So one thing that is being planned is some kind of online forum where people can share good practice that they know about that might be happening elsewhere in the country, uh, or possibly ideas, requests for support and advice. Um, so some of the things that were spoken about were limiting the number of people who can come to a service at any one time and staggering the time of services, um, whether prayer books should be disinfected, how often they should, should be disinfected, uh, and an interesting one about um, how religious organisations can triage people. So if somebody arrives at a church or a synagogue, should there be somebody at the door to take somebody's temperature? um and you know who who does that um how do you turn somebody away um if you know you've got critical mass in for a particular service so um it, it, it's a real difficult one and there's other stuff that the faith sector are obviously constantly engaged with and involved in like uh the food the food banks and food support and i've got an email from carl witty to respond to on that um and there's obviously the ongoing things about uh, burials and cremations as well. Uh, again, hopefully things will be eased um, slightly. But I mean, what we're finding is that there's some similar challenges between the faith sector and the wider BME sector as well. There's, there's some crossovers there. Yeah, so it's um, it's care leavers I work with. So I work for the Voice and Influence team at Leeds City Council. Um, and we have a group of young people called the Care Leavers Council who normally 
try and represent the wider group of care leavers and try and improve sort of um, children's social care and things like that. Um, but at the minute, the sort of focus is making sure that um, care leavers, a lot of whom are living on their own, quite isolated, quite young, are sort of still staying in touch and having lots of things to do. Um, so we've got weekly Zoom catch-ups that are open to any care leaver to join us where we just sort of do kind of learning things. So the other day, a young person did like an origami class with everyone. Um, and so there's two of those a week plus um, another meeting for a specific, a specific group. Um, and then we've also set up a Facebook group for care leavers, which is a mix of sort of social care staff. So personal advisors, people like myself and as many care leavers as we could get in the group. And it's got over 100 now. Wow. And that's what we're using to try and get kind of the key sort of messages out around um, health and well-being, sort of signposting to services, but also where they can come for any queries and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so similar to kind of what Jen said, I think bored young people is kind of the biggest, one of our biggest concerns and how that's affecting mental health at the minute. Mm-hmm. We're just trying to keep everyone um, both entertained and also sort of um, up with the guidance. So hi everybody, my name is Priya and um, I work for the City Council um, in the migration team based in the community service. Um, so my role is to um, develop and implement migration activity across the city. Um, and in terms of this meeting today, um, I wear the hat of being the link organisation for refugee asylum seekers and new and emerging communities. Um, and one of the key things um, in terms of our feedback in feeding into the communities of interest is through our migrant access project that works with um, community leaders from across the city that speak um, a range of different languages, they've been in the country for a while, speak a good level of English, so they are key in helping us to bridge the gap between communities and um, uh, services. Um, We speak with, uh, I'm in regular contact with Annette because a lot of our discussions do overlap and we try and um, look at how we can, uh, you know, join some of those those conversations up. Uh, We have a map, that's the Migrant Access Project, we call it MAP, uh, we have a virtual drop-in every Tuesday morning um, with a couple of services representing uh, each one that share um, guidelines of um, changes during COVID-19. Um, and we, and the key thing is ensuring that these community leaders understand the message so that they're able to share that, but at the same time, help us to understand some of the messages that don't get through, some of the issues that they're still having. So for example, we had um, a couple of, um, these were Roma families that were being evicted. So we worked with our migrant community networkers to share information, um, uh, you know, in in conjunction with our private sector team um, as to, you know, um, the the process and those, both of those families remained in the, in the, in the households. So it's about understanding some of those rights and, um, and it's really important that actually that we have those links so we can share that information so we've, you know, we've prevented something from happening there uh, we, and the team's also been involved with um, translating um, information in the top 10 languages there was an additional language that was requested which was um, Bengali um, and that they've been really um, crucial actually um, and we're looking at further uh, messages as well on topics that come up through through the books through our migrant access project so the more recent one has been around domestic violence so um i've just i was having conversations with our Save for leads colleagues just before this meeting um just to look at um looking at some of the messages that um, are coming through the communities and then looking at how we develop some sort of um a translated message mm-hmm. uh, going out going out that way um the romanian community really valued the videos um mm-hmm. Yeah, and our migrant community networkers, they want to continue doing doing things. They're not set up to do, working at home and we don't want to put them under any pressure. Mm-hmm. So we support them with a little bit of expense for them to use their phone and um, internet to help with some of these messages and then to feed back to us. And that's been working really well. Now, just going back to the Romanian community, uh, really positive feedback to say that um, she was really proud to see how the videos were um, uh, videos were made and she's seen this ripple effect of the messages being forwarded and forwarded and so it, she says it's you know it's spread really widely so that's really good to know um and i think for some communities it's the it's the videos that that, that work different communities have different needs and it's about us understanding um, some of that as well um the other thing was um some of the messages there were a lot of questions around this is what we're doing back home um and so obviously they 
communities are in touch with their families and friends back home. So there's been a lot of questions um, coming up uh, specifically to that. And we've just um, directed them to the guidelines that we have to follow here. Um, we've also um, identified um, some Eastern European communities that do need the extra support. So alongside the Migrant Access Project virtual drop-in, we've created one that's called POMOC. Uh, this was originally running in uh, Compton Community Hub but we're running it virtual now. Um, and it, this one is specific for um, uh, the Czech community, and we'll be looking at setting this up for the Romanian community. We're just trying to finalize our um, agreements in, in place for that. Um, so there's a, there's a lot going on there that we're feeding through the communities of interest. Brilliant, thank you, Priya. That's really good. Ali, would you like to go next from an older people's perspective? The things we're picking up is that there's a great diversity within the older population in, in Leeds. And one of the things that really hasn't helped when it comes to talking about older people has been the ages framework within which um, the whole pandemic has been framed, you know, from the initial over 70s all have to stay at home, but without differentiating need and highlighting different inequalities between different groups. So that has made it a bit difficult actually to talk about the needs of older people with a lot of meaning behind it. Um, what we found from our delivery partners um, is that third sector organisations were really, really quick to respond to the need and really quickly reconfigured services. So most went to an immediate um, telephone befriending service to ensure that all of their service users were contacted on a regular basis. So we have um, neighborhood networks, for example, who are, who are delivering over 1,000 telephone calls a week um, at the same time on the same day. So there's a lot of regularity built in and that's really helped to make a difference to quite a lot of old people and to keep them connected within their communities. Um, neighborhood networks are very, on the whole, quite well plugged in to local services so that people with specific health needs and practical needs can then be quickly referred, referred on. Um, partners are also delivering a, a range of activity packs to older people across Leeds for things for them to do in their homes and um, to do in their gardens. Um, and a number of organisations um, have really been promoting digital inclusion amongst their older service users who aren't already connected. Um, and that's going well. And that is actually something that is really, really growing. I think it's one of the positives that, come out, that has come out of this is older people's organisations um, really getting behind um, the need to promote digital inclusion amongst service users. And they're doing a hell of a lot of work around that. Um, of course, one of the issues there is for older people who aren't digitally connected, particularly, and particularly in some areas, it's an issue. So for example, in Seacroft, um, it's quite an issue. Um, in the Middleton area, it's quite an issue. And so it's then about sort of practical hands-on means, if you like, of um, ways of making sure older people remain active and engaged. Um, in terms of mental health and well-being, we're getting really mixed reporting back. In some areas, this is um, an issue now, but in other areas, people are saying, well, the people that they're working with, um, well, the people that they've worked with for some time seem to be quite well. What we are finding is that because of COVID, a lot of our members have received new referrals, um, particularly from older men who've remained quite isolated, but have had practical needs which have driven them to contact a local organisation. Um, and those older men and older women who have come forward, who have been very vulnerable and very isolated, tend to have a high level of need. Um, and that's going to be ongoing because hopefully members will keep working with them after COVID. So that will be um, an ongoing issue in terms of how that is resourced and how the complex needs of um, members of the older population um, are met. Um, the immediate, the sort of 
the mid short to mid term issue that members are facing is how they can begin to deliver activities um, that are socially distanced for those older people who aren't in the shielded group, aren't in the vulnerable groups. Um, and they're those who are really desperate to get back out again, but there's also going to be some people who will need their confidence to be boosted in order to sort of re-enter. I mean, I, th I don't know about anyone in this group, but I'm sort of feeling that myself. So, yeah. you know, sort of going out into the big wide world again is kind of a bit odd, really. We don't know what it's going to be like. Um, so a lot of members are starting to think about what that might look like and practically what it might involve. Um, we Good. had one... Many people are agreeing with that point. Quite a few thumbs going up in agreement to that point. Yeah. That that's something that's going to be a growing issue. Yeah, and that's something that we're, we're looking at and we're promoting case studies when we see them. So, you know, for example, um, we, we published a blog this week, Richmond Hill Elderly Action did street bingo last week. Um, their service users really love bingo um, and they did street bingo which was just phenomenally successful and they're going to start doing street lunches as well all of which is socially distanced people and get people in care homes can engage from bedroom windows people can engage from their doorsteps and front gardens yeah, really um, yeah. so it, there's a really broad range of issues going on really and, and I think some of so maybe some of the more negative issues I think will become more and more pronounced as COVID continues and as we start to move away from complete lockdown actually and NAPOD networks are reporting that they're quite concerned about the longer term in impact in terms perhaps maybe of post-traumatic and any mental health issues. What we have found is that people have reported mental health mental health issues amongst people who are already not well yeah. i mean there are levels of anxiety don't get me wrong but it's it no, you know really helpful ali and obviously there are cases but across the city it's yeah there's a lot of variety yeah um yeah we've also been been doing a lot of follow-up calls with bme communities um oh, i'm on it by the way and i work for following traction leads along with Anne, and i lead on the bme hub <laughs> Um, we've been contacting um, organisations and just getting the general feeling of how people are feeling now. Um, so as opposed to how people felt before, the, the main issue for a lot of communities I've been speaking to um, are around the um, disproportionate impact on BME communities, obviously, of COVID-19. That's still a, a, a worry. And people going back to work and going back to school. So obviously because that's a worry BME people are wondering you know sending their children back into school is that a risk for them and also in the work environment as well going back into the work environment if um you know is, is there is there provision in place for them so people are concerned generally concerned a lot of families are saying they won't be sending their children back to school just yet until they're they've got some guarantees that the, the virus is you know is no longer active but that might be obviously another another big issue um so those sorts of those sorts of underlying worries that are worrying people on top of that there are the fact that people um are concerned that after this is over that we continue pushing forward to address the inequalities and the gaps that have led to some of the communities experiencing what they're experiencing now so that's that's kind of going forward the main um crux of what people are feeling um for now so we'll see what happens next. Oh, that's great. And then Anna, do you want to pick up? I know some of those issues around confidence were things that you were reflecting from Health Watch. Yeah, absolutely. We, we've just, um, as part of our weekly check-ins, we've been recently um, surveying carers, both paid and unpaid, and that came up really strongly, especially among that unpaid carers group about real reluctance to suddenly get out there as if nothing, you know, as if as if straight back to normal. There's real fears among that group in particular about bringing the virus back home to loved ones. Um, but um, just to give you a, a, the update from Healthwatch, um, hi everyone, I'm, I'm here to represent uh, Harriet, who's our young people's champion at Healthwatch. Um, just three quick 
organizational updates from us um, we we started developing a crisis resource a, a mental health crisis resource specifically aimed at young people um, on the back of a lot of the crisis work we've been doing at health watch leads for about a year now and um, that is being developed it, um, along with um, a group of young volunteers they're helping with the wording and things like that so that's in the draft stage at the moment so four of our volunteers have been have been working have been working with MindMate to create those videos, and the the purpose of those videos, the core purpose is um, to encourage young people um, to seek mental health support during the crisis, get, getting across the message that you're not a burden, you're not wasting any time anybody's time because of the because of the coronavirus crisis, and the services are still very much open for them. Um, so that's a couple of the things that we've been doing recently um, and just last one um, I don't you may have heard about this last week so sorry if I'm repeating stuff you don't you already know um, but one of our recent weekly check-in reports was um, was about young people's mental health um, so we, we got 49 responses to that from young people the survey was was run completely online um, so of course there'll be, there will be a section of the young, younger population that we couldn't reach online unfortunately. Um, so um, unsurprisingly um, that survey suggested that yes there certainly has been a big effect on young people's mental health. Um, our findings suggested that the effect is actually somewhat more um, that people aged 19 to 25 um, are somewhat more likely to just describe quite severe feelings and symptoms compared to a slightly younger group that young adult age group um, are really um, struggling with feelings of being trapped often living in you know a small flat in the middle of in the middle of town not being able to access any green space also more likely to say um, they have an existing mental health condition as well Thank so that slightly older age group has really um, really stood out in, in our survey yeah, I was just typing away actually in response to Anna that some of the stuff that um, has come back on that survey is reflected in some of the mental health organisations that I'm working with as well, um, particularly around um, organisations looking at where they target peer support sessions and, and young people coming up really strongly um, within that. So issues of um, body image and self-image and having to see yourself on, on Zoom and on the camera all the time and obviously um, that being um, a particular interest and, and a worry to younger people and, and yeah the isolation that, that that's causing um, so that's definitely something that's that's come up um, amongst sort of peer support um, groups also parents so that um, echoes what some of the other people on the call have said working parents parents um, with young children at home and, and the, just the variety of different um, conflict in demands that that brings for people I suppose um, people with autism also whether they're um, getting sort of the, the right service and whether digital is the, is the right service for some people um, so that's coming up quite a lot and carers just in general um, came up um, across sort of a lot of the mental health organizations I think there's, there's in terms of mental health specialism um, sort of community of interest work there's, there's two two worries i suppose there's the existing um sort of populations of people that are known um particularly with serious mental illness that's sort of known to secondary services and how how people are coping there but also um I, I suppose the unknown and the demand on the future services and what that might look like is quite worrying for organizations and also um you know there's a there's a potential new cohort of people out there who are, who are struggling with uh, mental health for the first time or low level of well-being and not really knowing what to do with that so we've been doing some work around um, paper-based resources that we're trying to get out there to make sure that um we're connecting with um people who may never have experienced um mental health issues before but also that they um you know that we're connecting with people that aren't possibly digitally connected um, and those in the most sort of vulnerable areas that might be utilizing food banks and things like that so that's some work that's sort of come out of listening to our mental health community of interest i suppose it's worth just mentioning that from my uh, perspective i also link in with um caris um on the psi stuff so the sensory impairment work so i think caris has covered most of that but there is still issues around those who lip read and masks and um just how uh, how much of a barrier that is to communication for people if they if they use sign language or if they lip read or um even you know people with learning disabilities the use of um 
facial expressions is so important in communication and, and that's a real issue for, for people. Also for the long-term health conditions um, cohort of, of, sort of community of interest work, I think there's a lot of confusion around what is shielding and still and who should be shielding and and you know I've heard some reports this week of organization from organizations where people have previously been sent a letter to say they should shield and now they've had another letter to say actually perhaps maybe you don't and, and the emphasis is very much going on the individual um, to make that decision based on what medication they might be taking etc and so there's some general confusion and also in as well people who um have been getting some reports back people who um having language barriers obviously english not the first mm. language but accessing the gp or those type of medical services if they haven't got interpreters so people have stopped altogether um, and also accessing basic medication people have been struggling to access basic medication if they have large families and they've not got enough calpo for all the kids or because if one gets sick they're all getting sick so this is becoming a, 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 bigger, a bigger problem within some families as well. Um, just to say that we've done the follow-up calls. As Jen alluded to, some of the young people have got bored with the stay home and they're, they're now out. Outreach uh, workers are meeting them in the parks, trying to get the message out um, and re-education and things. A lot of the activities that I've focused on this week have been around with children with additional needs, with complex needs, and organisations trying to organise some sort of play schemes to, for the summer, uh, for the summer holidays. Um, as um, was referred to earlier, issues around the social distancing, so where they would have worked with 35 children they'll be able to work with 12. Where they could have had um, 20 children, they'll be able to have nine. And they're having to identify children that probably have the least need because they're not able to provide sort of the medical needs and the personal care. So some of the children that probably do need those activities won't be able to um, access them. So that's been one of the key things. Other organisations saying that some families, they're having difficulties because they're now going back to coping with using alcohol, substance abuse. Some families going back to self-harm, um, families that haven't done that for a long time, but it's their coping mechanism um, things. So I think those are the key things from us. And as Anna said, mental health, it's dealing with the numbers that they've got now, but the, the expected influx as the lockdown eases. And actually, I think it's right, Anna mentioned that around mental health, but I think Ali mentioned it around older people. I think there's quite a few different bits of the system that actually are expecting that, you know, longer term, there's more demand. And, you know, not only are we creating issues, but we're also finding people that perhaps previously weren't in touch with services too. Should we start with talking a little bit about the Walk to Test Centre? So hopefully everybody's now had the leaflet. Um, I think Daisy was able to send out. Um, we were hoping to get it yesterday, but in the end it came very late yesterday. So uh, is everybody broadly aware that um, Leeds is pioneering um, really in that we're setting up a Walk to Test Centre? There will be others around the country, but the Leeds one is ahead of the others. And actually, I think part of the reason, um, you know, is that we really raised issues around concerns about access for testing, because it was one of the issues that had come up that if you didn't have a car and a phone that had plenty of data, and if English wasn't either your first language or a language that you had confident skills in, it was incredibly difficult um, to deal with the test centres. So it's really great that that's being um, worked out and worked through here in Leeds. So it's it's down at the um, church on Bridge Street, so um, sort of right on the edge really of sort of Hare Hills and the city centre. So one of the priorities will be to help make sure that word goes out to people who live within walking or cycling distance or motorbike it could be 
but it can't be a car. If people did have access to a car, they would be asked to go to the um, Temple Green is the, the kind of general drive through test centre. So a huge amount of work's gone in. And I know Priya, you've um, and other colleagues are working to get. Um, so there's been good work, I think, to get the um, information out in an easy read format and hopefully when that arrived to you they I think quite a lot of work and again I think that's one of the issues that we as a group have raised about clear and accessible information and there's work now Priya isn't there to translate that into the main community languages so I think the next thing is to think about how we as organizations and networks and our our wider networks just help make sure that that word is out and that people know that it's there that it can be accessed by anybody that can walk to that has needs for testing so it's for members of the public not just for kind of key work because it's absolutely you know open and accessible um, there are some concerns about demand I think there's a bit of a worry that there might be a massive demand but actually I think the experience of Temple Green is that it takes a bit of time to build that up so certainly in the shorter term I think really helping to get that message out until we're here to maybe slightly rein that in is to put that effort out and um, I know Priya and others and Annette are working directly with specific organisations that are based in either the sort of city centre or kind of reasonable walking distance of that. But anything else that we can do would be incredibly helpful around that. The next thing I wanted to say a little bit about was just about reset of services. Um, particularly it's come up, it was great to hear Karis talking about BSL people in hospitals and I think quite a few of you have mentioned there was a something on the chat wasn't there about LTHT there's a big you know there was this kind of close down of lots of services and there's a real effort now to kind of reopen things up but a real sense that that needs to be done obviously very carefully with all of the um, you know distancing and all of the things that you touched on um, already Anne around and Annette and other people have mentioned but also there's a real push in the city to try and make sure that we're thinking about equalities as things open up so we're really trying to make sure that accessibility and opening up for the people who might find it hardest to access services and provision is is being considered so to give you reassurance that that the importance of that message around health is being heard and we're doing everything we can to kind of raise that and um i think that will include you know some of this i think we've mentioned you know some things are actually a bit more accessible for some people certainly some people have liked things like the gp online um accessibility but not for everybody so um it would be really good to hear people's particular thoughts one of the things in particular is um thinking of using 111 and encouraging people to to make better use of that before going to A&E and walking. So to try and, it's not about changing the system quite, but it's, it's about using people have got a bit more used to doing that. So can we push that further? Because actually in the long run, you know, that makes it safer and, and better for people. So there will be things like that. So if people have got any particular thoughts on any of those kind of access to other services, and I know obviously Health Watch and others will be linking with that. Um, but yeah there's there's meetings happening around that so we've got an opportunity to help influence that because that's you know part of what we're about in terms of shielding so we've had um, some really great input haven't we previously from Rachel Loftus and she's done a huge amount to really humanize the conversation about shielding in Leeds I think it is a real challenge when they're talking about these big government lists and numbers and figures and trying to find people but in Leeds we've done a lot to try and put the person at the heart of what that feels like for people and then also to think about um, people in areas where the take-up is lower which often is people from some of um, BAME communities so particularly Pakistan communities and Caribbean African communities there were some really detailed bits of information which on that um, there's like a shielding dashboard which um, we've shared and hopefully people have seen and if anybody wants that kind of information there is that information I think one of the things that we want to ask all of you to think about is, is what more can we do to make sure that people who have had those letters and do need to be shielding are making it known and connecting and getting the support and help they need 
um, I completely take on board this issue about sometimes it's been confusing and I think a few people will have had um, conflicting messages but I think the vast majority of cases it's it's actually that we don't know all of those people we've only had this sort of return response from well half at most and in some areas it's sort of 30 percent of people so just to kind of remind people that keeping that conversation about shielding and doing anything we can to help reach people Annette just want to say that yeah at, at Val obviously because um the stats have shown a lot of the people who have not registered are from BME communities so what we're doing at Val is we're, we're looking at the we've got the information that's gone out the the roadmap so we're looking at some of the information that's in that and then we're going to um, pull together a, a very simplified explanation of why it's important to um, to register and what the benefits of it are and where the where the information goes and that kind of thing and we're going to send it out sort of target the BME community specifically Excellent. with that so we're trying that's to just a great example isn't it of just bringing something that's this huge issue into a very clear thing and Priya I know um, you've put on the chat that Rachel and you have spoken about some videos and I think especially given what we've heard earlier that you know videos are you know a really helpful way to get some of these messages across and to share so that's really good as well our connections that they're bored and they desperately want to come back so we've been thinking about how we can sort of stagger some of the sessions and and start you know reintroducing that but I suppose one of my concerns is that if we open our centre too soon we're going to send a message out that encourages people to come to us because they would see that as being okay to just do that again and things back to normality so it would be really good to perhaps link in with some of the organizations that are particularly focused on older people and um you know perhaps get in touch with yourself Ali and have a look at maybe some of the ways we can perhaps support the community partly from a distance and when we do manage to sort of reopen the doors again and, and get people back involved because I know that everybody's missing those groups and those social activities from the deaf community. No, that's such an important point, Karis, isn't it? As to how, yeah, we try and reintroduce what we know people really need. I think that's really important. And it's also worth remembering about the Are You OK? Um, there's a phone helpline that um, Leeds Older People's Forum have been training some of the volunteers. And that's a really great resource that uses people quite often that have got lived experience themselves some of them are trained counsellors there's a huge breadth of skill and knowledge and you know that's a really important thing that can link but also longer term can hopefully help reconnect people mm. to services so trying to keep and you know one of the big things that daisy's very helpfully done is keep up to date information about services as they change and how we kind of connect people and keep that sense of how things are shifting and moving wendy you had your hand up uh just maybe it's a bit negative <laughs> i mean because it's so brilliant there's so much positive really proactive work going on everywhere but i'm i'm really really worried about the amount of increased mental health we see in everywhere the likelihood yeah. that when we open up we are flooded with people who want support and we're not going to be able to manage it there's not going to be lots of additional funding out there and councils are underfunded because they've got all the parking charges and everything else how on earth are we going to manage this when everybody else comes in, comes back into us wanting support and we know that there's going to be increased need? So I am really, really worried about this and how, we, how we're going to work together. We're going to have to work really creatively together uh, even more in the next stage Absolutely. because how on earth are we going to reach these people when we're when reduced, the increased demand and reduced services when we come back out of this situation? And I think that working together, I think making use of the brilliant voluntary action leads kind of volunteering response, which, you know, we know there are, you know, literally thousands of people who've signed up for that. And how do we really make that work for the sector and make sure that, you know, we've kind of got opportunities to kind of link across? I think you're absolutely right. And I think it is, you know, I think it was uh, Lucy who described it as a bit of a concern about a bit of a tsunami almost of kind of mental health stuff that people have held it down haven't they they've held it together and actually you know there is a real concern about all of that so and health access as well um you know it'd be it, it, i know that people were saying that they uh, was it you and netu were saying that uh, people weren't accessing health services and 
so we're going to have this huge influx of, of health issues as well and yeah. building their confidence to come back to yeah. use health services so that I we don't even, have as much of that. You're right, Wendy, because I think even in the long term, people are going to be still a bit concerned about going to the hospital. going Because of, I, <coughs> sorry, I had a um, conversation with an organisation that said people in their community feel that the hospital want to kill them and they want them to die. So if you go to hospital and you're sick, you won't come out because they'll, they'll kill you. And that, this, is, this is a real message that's going around communities. So people will not even go to the hospital if they're ill. You know, they're saying if they, if they, some people have said, if I get sick, don't take me to the hospital. So it's a big worry. It is a big worry, but actually we've got really good community services and some of what we've long wanted actually, isn't it, is different provision. And I think, you know, we've got to take that energy and, and push pressure on other bits of the system to pick that up. And there are, you know, really, I think there's some good people in Leeds who kind of really want to help, but we've got to keep that pressure up, haven't we? And we've got to kind of really keep fighting. And, you know, I know, Wendy, your other point that you've made to me is about people's rights and you know we need people to feel confident and strong and to get what they need and to kind of make choices and have good choices you know and actually there will be some really really tough things but we at least can help people kind of be part of making positive decisions and we can push and make sure that we're doing what we can to raise those issues but you're right Wendy it's you know it's easy to want to hang on to the positives and the partnerships but it is really really bleak isn't it for organizations the only way we're going to do it is through um and increasing those partnerships and and carrying on some of that innovation a uh, longer yeah. term but yeah yeah i'm really concerned about rights you know we're from an advocacy organization we're seeing it for older people for younger people yeah. with complex needs but you know there's there's all this temporary suspension of rights which is is really concerning for us yeah. and and we need to really get that out there um early on before things get a bit more entrenched yeah yeah the other thing um in terms of sort of other updates was just thinking about the reporting and the next thing to have a bit of discussion about what next um so we shared the full report just with you as a group just um so hopefully um it didn't clog up your you know i know there's a lot of information but i think it's once you track and see which bit of it is relevant for you we felt it was better to kind of be sharing that because then you know kind of what that's looking like that information absolutely is feeding up through public health and into conversations it's feeding through um communities team and leela's report into the council but we are interested as well as making sure that we have a third sector voice on all of this um and you know what other messages and conversations do we want to have where else do we need to take that and use that so you know no strong views about that but just making sure that we're kind of sharing that back because this is you know this is your information that you've helped us pull together um you know along with the um the issues that come out of, of these sessions too just very briefly i thought it's worth kind of coming out coming back to some of the things that came out particularly of last time's session just so you see that we kind of do practical kind of useful things with that so one of the big issues both from last time and the first time was about accessible clear information in formats that people can access and i think you know the leaflets that have come out about the testing center and the increasing use of video um, we're also producing some kind of pictorial ways of representing what we're doing so hopefully that is part of the thing that will help with that and i absolutely hear um what people have said about shielding and needing greater clarity around who's shielding and who's not shielding so that people who actually don't need to be shielding can have that confidence to go back out into the world and um yeah to to kind of to live well and happy one of the things Annette mentioned, there's this whole, um, there's a big template that Rachel Loftus has put together about making sure people who are shielding are happy and healthy. And that, again, is a really positive piece of work that we're doing that um, it talks about finances, education and childcare, safeguarding, 
all of the practicalities around food and medicine and being ferried about health and well-being social life and also care needs so all of those kind of different areas so what we're doing is making sure that all of this information helps furnish that and again that kind of gets raised nationally and locally and you know it help, helps hopefully make a difference one of the other things um, that came out from last week was around mental health and uncertainty and I think a sense of bereavement and fear and some of those big issues which absolutely you know we've fed back I think the fact that it was mental health week last week was a really good opportunity and kindness being the theme for that again was something that felt like it resonated for a lot of people so we're working to get blogs and information and good access and resources and particularly mind well um you know i don't know how that fits on all of your radar but for me i'm so proud of the brilliant way in which mind well have just kind of risen to the challenges and produced information and got it out there and been incredibly responsive actually and i think that also you know is is you know of all the difficult things it's, it's a good thing that perhaps comes out it's partly the recognition of the good local resources that we have and certainly one of the conversations I often have with people is reminding them to make those local links, not just to have the national links, because often our local information is better and clearer. And it's certainly more likely to take people to something that they can access. Um, and carers, I think, was was the other um, kind of issue that's come through. And again, you know, it's important today. And I think carers, unpaid carers, family carers, that whole you know, um, it's such an important group that adds so massively, don't they, to the health and care system. And I think that's something that we just keep keep fighting for as well. Can I just yeah. add something to that quickly, Pip, just to say, um, I found out um, yesterday that the um, family carers, those that care at home, uh, that have someone that goes, goes to a day centre, that they will be, they will be the first to go back to the day centre. So they'll be able to at least give family carers a break because my mum was one of them so it's just you know what she's experiencing having my brother at home and you know getting that letter was a real relief because she was worried that you know she might be ended at the end of the pile because often carers don't feel as if they're you know they're, they're part of the the, the system and that's such a good example, isn't it? That if we were to put health inequalities and communities of interest first, that's such a good tangible example. So let's tell people about that. And if we've got other examples of, you know, I'm interested to hear more, Caris, about the BSL one. And, you know, if we can just say, look, these are the kind of practical, tangible things that can start helping and making a difference. Because I think we also have to keep trying to bring it to life. I think lots of people, you know, particularly planners and people who deal with very big numbers and huge tasks, I think helping them kind of humanise and understand what that feels like for people on the receiving end is, is also part, obviously, of Health Watch's work, but something we can help with. Um, Karen has been leading on a bit of work that we've been doing in partnership with colleagues in the CCG and others um, and, and some of yourselves as well around um, getting paper resources developed. Um, Nicola Mindwell has also been helping us with that. And we've just sent a very brief survey out to people just to get a sense of, in terms of the people that you're working with and supporting, you know, are there gaps in terms of the information? What would be useful for people um, in terms of particular access? So are there particular groups of people, you know, particular community languages that there's a real lack of um, resources out, out there about mental health and wellbeing on? Um, just really to get a sense of what might be needed um, with the view that we don't want to make people's lives more difficult. We want to try and make sure that, that people are getting the information they need about mental health and well-being at this time when obviously everyone is experiencing more pressure on their um, mental health. So if you haven't already seen that, we can send out that link again. It would be useful for people. And I think the response time is, yeah. Karen, is it next Monday we're asking people to get back to us by? Yeah, yeah. We've, we've yeah. left it relatively short that, so that we can crack on with getting but, the right uh, things designed and developed. Emily's as well. Emily's um, link around women's experiences. Is, it would be good. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I think we've got to keep asking. And actually, these are good ways, aren't they, to take the temperature and kind of find out what people think. Yeah. And I 
so long as we're showing that we're using, I don't think people mind responding to surveys and being asked about things if they can see that it has an impact and makes a difference. So Yeah, there's three, three, three asks within that survey, I suppose, or three offers. So the foldable crisis research a resource, which might well develop in um, the one or two page sort of helpful numbers um, list and then some self-help resources. So, we, yeah, we're really keen to hear what people think the people that you're working with really do need and want at this time so not to do, not to duplicate if there's something that you've already created or if there's something that already exists but to make sure that we try and address um gaps or, or you know particular um communities that, that might not be getting the information that they need in terms of signposting and support that they can um, find from the city's services but also self-help stuff as well just uh, in terms of accessibility, uh, kind of like obviously easy read applies to some people, but my kind of feeling is easily accessible information and, and kind of information that's in a good format. And there was a resource produced um, around kind of communicating with autistic uh, adults and, and, and kind of I think as a general rule, what suits autistic people suits most people um, and that, that it's really good. I'll try and find that resource because I saw it on Facebook, I'll confess, and I haven't managed to actually track down the actual resource. But it, look, it's a really good guide on how to produce information so that it's easily accessible. 